let this uh, let this stand as like the one and only time anyone on this show is going to quote Piers Morgan. <laughs> Megan McPeak, where were you when England lost Euro 2020? Uh, not watching Euro 2020 and the penalty kicks. I was actually been watching Queen of the South from season three on. Amazing. Which was a definite, de- definite better decision than, than <laughs> what uh, Italy and England put uh, the viewers through. <laughs> I, I used to watch Queen of the South, like the original Queen of the South as a telenovela with uh, Kate Del Castillo. And they were like in, and you know, and she went from Mexico to that little Spanish mm-hmm. enclave in Morocco and everyone had like the Spanish accent. Que and uh, como estas, all of this stuff. So <laughs> I remember that show very well. Dave Zyron, what were you doing um, when England lost Euro 2020? Yeah, I wasn't watching. I was at Oriole Park at Camden Yards, melting in the heat, watching the Baltimore Orioles lose an extra innings to the (laughs) Chicago White Sox. Interesting. Well, where was I when England lost Euro 2020? I was at home kind of half watching, half doing some work with my wife and our daughter, and we wound up hugging like... uh, Gareth Southgate and uh, Bukayo Saka, not because we were overly sad, but just because we're an affectionate family, but it was a big deal. And we're going to talk more about Euro 2020, uh, who won, who lost, and why, and the uh, predictable aftermath uh, a little bit later in the episode. But for now, welcome back to Bring It In with Morgan Campbell. I'm your host, Morgan Campbell. And if you, as an audience, if you've been with us this far, all these weeks, all these months, if you like what you're hearing, please engage with us. Uh, you can leave a like on YouTube. You can leave a comment. You can subscribe to CBC Sports uh, channel. If you dislike what you're hearing, you can hit dislike. You can leave a nasty comment. We don't care. All engagements matter. We're just trying to feed the algorithm, keep it happy, just like we try to keep you guys happy. Send us um, your ideas for inner out because sometimes they make it into the rotation. But I don't do this by myself. I'm joined by the best panel in the business. Joining us from Washington, D.C. with the poster of the John Carlos book cover over his shoulder. The author of 11 books, sorry, the author of 10 books with an 11th on the way. So technically the author of 11 books. Uh, Dave Zyron, how are we doing? Doing great. Great to be here. Perfect. And also joining us from Washington, D.C., getting ready to fly to Toronto from Dulles, which is nowhere near as convenient as flying to Toronto from Reagan National. (laughs) Play-by-play voice of the Washington Mystics, um, play-by-play play-by-play voice of the Capital City Go-Go, one of the voices of Olympic basketball here on CBC, uh, Megan McPeak, how we doing? Doing great, happy to be here. Good to be with you guys as always. <laughs> okay. So listen, as I said, we are gonna talk uh, Euro 2020 and the fallout. Uh, we're gonna get to that. Uh, before that, we're also gonna talk basketball because like, with Megan McPeak on the show, you can't not talk basketball. <laughs> but we're gonna start off with a reminder that COVID-19 is still with us. Like we act like the pandemic is over and people are using the word pa- post, the phrase post pandemic, like it, like it applies to the present tense, but it doesn't. Just in the last week, we've had um, Tyson Fury, uh, heavyweight title fight between Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder uh, postponed because several members of Tyson Fury's camp, including Tyson Fury, came down with COVID-19, the Delta variant. Uh, meanwhile, the Delta variant is also running rampant in Fiji, 6% vaccination rate, hundreds of new infections every day. It's not a big country, this is a big deal. So passenger flights are pretty much restricted in and out of Fiji, which means uh, Fiji's Olympic team uh, had to basically hitch a ride to Tokyo with a cargo plane full of frozen fish, which is a funny story in some ways, like it's strange. It's not the way you think of Olympians arriving, arriving at the Olympics, but you also think about the fact that like that is so far from being an optimal way to travel that you have to wonder at some point, like what, how does that affect performance? Because this is a, this is a product and to, and, and to the extent that it's a, a, a broadcast property, it is. And so you can make the case like that the on-field performance doesn't matter if you're a broadcaster, you, if you produce it the right way, you know, what we're here for is the stories and blah, blah, blah. Cool. But for the competitors, it's a competition. Megan McPeak, how would you feel if you had to go ride to the biggest uh, sporting event of your life alongside somebody's frozen dinner in a cargo uh, vehicle? Oh, it, they're... 
there's so many, I have so many, so many questions, so many questions. And I understand that, you know, Fiji is not a country that has an abundance of money with their Olympic committee, just, you know, lying around Mm -hmm. kind of waiting to be used. But I feel like the officials in Fiji could have figured out something better than sticking these elite athletes who are trying to actually do something for their country and win medals to uplift their country and their uh, fellow Fijian people that all you could find was a cargo plane to put them on that was also transporting fish. Like I would be so, I would feel so disrespected by my country that that's how you feel is the best way and the most optimal way to get me there. I understand the COVID situation, but you can't tell me that there's at least one other plane. Like there has to be one other plane that was most likely grounded that would have been leaving Fiji when this new lockdown and restrictions happened with this outbreak. Like there had to be another option to get these athletes out of the country and on their way to Tokyo safely rather than stick them in a cargo plane. Because for those that don't know, cargo planes are not comfortable. They are not flashy. You're mm-hmm. like they're worse than sitting in the in the last row of coach, the row that's right beside the bathroom. Right. And now you add on the fact that you're also flying with frozen fish. And yes, they're frozen, but at the same time, at a certain point, the uh, whatever is used to keep them frozen, whether it's ice, whether it's you know on dry ice, eventually you learn the smell and it starts mm-hmm. to permeate through an enclosed tube. People, yes. it's a, it's an enclosed tube that they're flying in with probably hundreds of pounds of frozen fish. Like I would feel so disrespected. I understand. Like they had to figure out something and mm. the best way to get them there, but they could have used an extra 24 hours to figure a better way rather than just plopping these athletes on a cargo plane with frozen fish and saying, good luck. Now go win us some medals. Yeah. And it's also a chilly flight. Like I would imagine if you have enough refrigeration in this plane to keep the fish frozen, like it, you can't, you can't right. keep that out of the cabin where the people are sitting. And like, to the extent that this, this matters, like we're not just talking about also rands in every event, like Fiji doesn't have a huge team and like the, some events, yes, you know, the Fijian athletes are there just kind of filling out the field, making the Olympics more international, but in rugby sevens, men's and women's, these are men's, especially, I don't know the women's, I don't have the women's field uh, memorized, but men's, this is a, this is a medal contender. They won last time. Like this is, these are serious, serious medal contenders with serious, serious uh, preparations underway. And you wouldn't, uh, like the NBA players going over there. They're not, they're not um, hitching a ride with somebody. They're not riding uh, with, with, um, you know, a plane full of auto parts or anything like that. So this has like in the performance implications. Dave Zirin, you're about to say something. I'm always about to say something. I mean, <laughs> that should be on, almost, that should just be on your t-shirt. About to say yeah, something. Yeah, th- 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 there's a question that hangs over this discussion, which is why are hundreds of pounds of frozen fish being flown to the fresh fish capital of the world in Japan? I'm I'm curious <laughs> about the last like why Japan needs that much frozen fish. Um, but second of all, it just points to me the fact that th- these Olympics are going to have an asterisk hanging over them, the size of Andre the Giant and Haystacks Calhoun combined. <laughs> Because <laughs> you're talking about a situation, you know, going a year late, you know, 2021 Olympics in 2020, the context of COVID, and there will be an outbreak during these games. I'm very sorry to say, and I want to say something about that in a second. But like asking athletes to commit to peak performance in these circumstances mm-hmm. is ridiculous. And let alone not having fans in the stands, which we know adds to the adrenaline and the ability of athletes to perform at their peak. So th- there's so much about these Olympics that are that are problematic. And the only winner of these Olympics, I think is gonna be people who oppose the concept of public health. Uh, the story over the weekend that hangs with me so much is mm-hmm. the story that relates to this directly is Michael Andrew, who's the swimmer from the United States, who's practically boasting about the fact that he's not taking the vaccine uh, because he doesn't want it to uh, connect, like like in any way interfere with his absolute peak performance because he cares what goes on in his body and he doesn't want to risk a vaccine messing with his times, which is utter garbage from a health perspective. Mm -hmm. But it does make me wonder how many athletes 
who live in this um, egomaniacal bubble about what they put in their bodies and what they don't put in their bodies at the expense of public, how much of that is going to be unleashed in Tokyo? How much of that is going to be unleashed? And I think we're going to look back and think, my goodness, the people from Fiji were at least careful Mm -hmm. about getting their athletes out to these games, frozen fish or not, because the United States is not measuring up to Fiji. In basketball over the weekend, there was a seismic upset. Uh, Olympic tune-up exhibition game. Team USA versus Team Nigeria. Uh, one of these teams won by three points. Which team was that, Megan? Uh, it was Team Nigeria. Okay, now... That's a surprise. I think the USA, since the uh, professionals era in world basketball, uh, has only lost like three exhibition games. Um, now you tell me, Megan, is this uh, a sign of the apocalypse? Or is it this, a sign that um, this is a competitive field now? And that it's a, the, it's the a sign that it's a competitive field. The land, the, I wouldn't necessarily say the landscape is shifting towards another company being, or another country, excuse me, being dominant. But it's mm. definitely not the apocalypse. This is a sign that there is a shift in the parity amongst countries. So look back at the 92 Olympics, the dream mm. team, the infamous yeah. team. Everybody talks about how successful they are. But let's keep in mind, when they were doing their exhibition tune-ups, they lost to a select team comprised of mainly college kids, Grant Hill and company. It taught them a lesson that anybody can beat you at any given time when you think of the likes of Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, Michael Jordan. <laughs> we know the dream team, okay? Yes. So it's that was more of a shock because they were college kids. But what happened after that? The dream team was awoken and they completely dominated. This is not the 92 dream team. This is not the 92 Olympics. This is a show that, guess what? When you have parity across the board, you get competition. And was it a awakening for this U.S. roster? Yes, of course, it was. Also keep in mind, they're missing uh, Chris Middleton, Devin Booker, uh, who are playing in the NBA Finals. Mm -hmm. um, and Drew Holiday, apologies. Um, so and they also missing, haven't been practicing together very well. Correct. You're missing players that are key to your success. You're also figuring things out. You're working out the kinks. And the international game is much, much different than the NBA game. Nigeria did exactly what they should have done. They were also prepared. They were very physical with Team mm -hmm. USA. And in the NBA, you don't get that much physicality. You don't get that much leeway when mm -hmm. it comes to the whistle. There is a less favorable whistle to the NBA style of play in international basketball. The other thing with international basketball is you can't play one-on-one. -on -one. We saw it in the Canadian men's tournament uh, for the FIBA, qual or the FIBA qualifying tournament for the Tokyo that Canada played in Victoria, and we've seen it countless times in uh, international play. You have to play a set style, a team style. You can't just go one-on-one. -on -one. Basically, what I'm trying to say is you may have more talent, but your talent does not out-talent the other team when it comes to actually playing together. And Nigeria showed that when you play team basketball, when you have a bunch of guys that play cohesive basketball and play together and have chemistry and play the international game and are used to playing the international game, you can beat anybody on any given day. And that's what I like about the international style and what I'm excited to see with this Olympic Games because the parity and the uh, the parity across the board, excuse me, with countries has risen. So I think we're going to see a lot more competition in this Olympic Games on both the men's and the women's side. But it'll be interesting to me in group play how USA deals with the physicality, with the rule changes, because the biggest one is goaltending, completely different from mm -hmm. the NBA game. Travel, completely different from the NBA game. If you guys haven't seen it before, haven't seen it yet, there's a video of Zach Levine working with a few European guys who have played the international game, asking them to teach him the international travel because it is completely different from the NBA. And that's typically where NBA guys get caught up is the travel and as well to the goaltending, the physicality, and the three-point line is a few inches closer. Right, and it seems to me that a lot of the shock over this result comes from you know, these fallacies that sports writers buy into. 
uh, one of them being that like the the uniform matters like more than the people in it because I keep seeing these tweets, these reports. Well, USA beat Nigeria by seventy six points in twenty twelve. Okay, cool. But like, is this the twenty twelve Nigeria versus twenty twelve USA? No, it's not. There, it's a completely different group of people. It doesn't matter what happened last time. There's no carryover. None. These are different people, different coaches. All this time in between uh, to develop. And the other thing I think that shocked a lot of people. Uh, about this result is this is uh, kind of where two sets of racist stereotypes butt heads, right? Because there's a stereotype that says, uh, you know, black people are all good at sports. Look at the United States. Look at these black American athletes. Look how good they are at sports. Look at the Caribbean. Look at Usain Bolt. Look at all these sprinters. Cool. But when you talk about like people who are descendants, like I am of the transatlantic slave trade, like most of us on this side of the earth are descended of West Africans. And here we, ha here we have Nigeria. 206 million people, 206 million people. This is not like losing to Slovenia where they got 2 million people and one of them happens to be Luca right now. If they beat the USA, <laughs> that's a shock, right? We talked about it last week, uh, Sadoransky and the, the dad bod all-stars beating Canada. That's still a shock, but you have a country, 206 million people and like with big expat communities in places where people take basketball very seriously. 206 million people who your stereotype says should all be good at sports, right? It's not that big of a surprise that you could, that Nigeria could feel like serious contenders in a lot of sports. Um, and this time it happened to have been basketball. Dave Zyron, what do you make of that result? No, I still think it's a shock, Morgan. Well, uh, tell me. Maybe not, maybe not in the future, but in the present tense, because the future of basketball, I think the African continent is going to figure very strongly. That's why the NBA has started a league there, because they understand uh, that, that this is, in fact, the future. But it's not the present. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's put some respect on their names, first of all. KZ Akpala, Josh Okogi, Gabe Vincent, Ike and Wamu, and the legendary Precious Achua. <laughs> I mean, they came together and they beat the United States. That, that's an incredible thing. And coached by Mike Brown. Yes. Uh, avenging Greg Popovich for the 2007 NBA Finals. <laughs> I actually like that, especially because Mike Brown and Pop are, are good friends. Mike Brown has worked, uh, has actually studied under Pop after his head coaching gig in Cleveland, which makes me respect Mike Brown a great deal. Um, and Mike Brown showed that he is a top flight A plus coach, which I believe that he is. And so, uh, Props to them for that. I also want to give props to uh, somebody by the name of Samaki Walker. You remember Samaki yes. Walker drafted yep. 25 years ago? Probably best known for his draft day suit, which was a, a full white suit with a white fedora. No one has ever looked that <laughs> sweet and that swift on draft night than Samaki Walker. But Samaki Walker was writing up on Facebook uh, before this game. He was writing like, look, this iteration of the United States in USA basketball, men's to be clear, mm -hmm. do not play defense <laughs> and they don't know how to play physical. And you mentioned that 92 team. One thing about that 92 team, yes, they were going to dominate, but they also had Scottie Pippen, Michael Jordan, Clyde Drexler, David Robinson, Patrick Ewing. What do they have in common? Elite all-time defensive players yep. on that end, which you need in a more physical game. And the NBA has, you know, ratcheted back uh, how to play physical defense over the last generation to increase scoring. We all know this. Mm -hmm. And this is having a ripple effect in the international game. That's what Samaki Walker was arguing. And then I felt like the Nigeria game kind of backed that up in a lot of ways. And Nigeria should not be scoring 90 points if you're playing good one-on-one -on -one and also good team defense. And so that's what happened. So I, I think if it was a wake-up call, it was definitely a wake-up call on the defensive end for this team that like, whoa, this is not the NBA. We're going to have to put some bodies on some of these players or else you know we're headed towards a true international embarrassment. But props to Nigeria. Mm -hmm. This is an epic upset and one that will be discussed in, on, in Nigeria for, for years and years to come. Yeah, and it's and people forget too that like an, an 82 game basketball season, like there's a reason that the NBA season is 82 games and the finals are best of seven instead of one game. Like you get some of, you get elite performers together, the better team is gonna win seven or eight out of 10 times, but that eight is not 10, right? I am old enough to remember the expansion Toronto Raptors 
beating the Chicago, the 1995-96 Chicago Bulls at the Sky Dome. Um, I don't know if this is right. I don't know if this is an upset on that level. But again, in the sport of basketball, we have to accept that any sport that has a lot of games, even the best team is not going to go undefeated. Dave, I'm going to stay with you um, because we're talking about shocks, shocking outcomes. I want to ask you, which is more, which is less shocking to you, okay, that England found a way to lose another important international footy tournament or that English footy supporters uh, behave badly before the game, uh, brawling, forcing their way into the stadium with no tickets and behave badly after the game, showering um, Rashford, uh, who are the other two? Uh, Rashford and well, I'll look up their names, but the three black players that missed penalty kicks, showering them with racist abuse. Which of these was less shocking to you? Uh, well, definitely the second one, unfortunately. I mean, the, the, mm. the old expression is for, for black uh, soccer players is you're English when you win, you're black when you lose. I mean, so literally you're in this country, it's almost like a renunciation of your very citizenship if you don't win. And it's, it's, I would like to say that it's one of those things where you say it's shocking, but not surprising is the way I would put it. Because the level of race, I mean, anytime you see an outbreak of racism, uh, like we've seen, like we saw the other night, I mean, it, th there is a shock value to it. I mean, to see a, a mural of Marcus Rashford vandalized mm -hmm. is unbelievable to me. I was wondering if the people who vandalized that mural, if their children were fed because Marcus Rashford engaged in an unprecedented activist campaign during the heights of COVID. Right. Not only supply food to the poor of the UK, but also played a serious and recognized role in pressuring the government to actually provide subsidies for food. Yes. So we're talking about somebody, this wasn't just some, you know, oh, my foundation is, is putting out some, some free turkeys. This was something that, I mean, affected the lives of literally tens of millions of people across Great Britain because Marcus Rashford raised the temperature dramatically in the country around the question of, of, of youth hunger during COVID. And so I was like, how many of these folks had families that were fed by Marcus Rashford who are now turning on Marcus Rashford? And so it, it's not just about finding it shocking or disappointing, it's enraging. It mm -hmm. really is because it it comes back to, I mean, I think about Jackie Robinson saying, if I had to uh, make the Baseball Hall of Fame or have full citizenship for my people, I would choose full citizenship time and again. In, in England, in this example, there is no full citizenship. No. It's you are an outsider because you miss this kick. And that is truly a renunciation and a mark of shame, of not just on England, because this wouldn't only happen in England, I don't think. No, but at the same time, it happens in Canada, Dave. Yes, exactly. Exactly. This idea of conditional citizenship based upon your athletic skills. I mean, you can see that happen all over the, 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 the white Western world. But this is England's moment to feel shame because of this and to be rightly denounced because of the actions of its fans. Yeah, I, I mean, I was going to call it provisional and it's mm -hmm. there until you mess up. And then at that point, the mainstream calls themselves revoking your membership in this club. And like you, I'm not surprised. Like, and this is also predictable and it's part of a routine, it's part of a dance that we do because now like my inbox is, is filling up with like requests. Hey, can you do an interview with us to talk about how bad this racism is? And like, I didn't expect anything different to happen when, when uh, the last young guy missed the shot he didn't miss the shot sorry when the shot when the goalkeeper blocked the shot and because frankly like i do not ha i do not harbor expectations um i do not harbor high expectations of uh a lot of white sports fans it's not as like white individuals but just over time and we're not talking about uh isolated incidents here like i just have never seen evidence to show me that a group of people are going to react differently. And someone could look at me and say, well, isn't it racist of you to uh, assume that white people are going to uh, say racist things about black people after an incident like this? Because I'm, I'm sure that person's going to show up in the comments and, you know, I wouldn't have to feel that way if white people wouldn't do racist stuff. I don't, I don't 
I don't harbor low expectations of white people who are not racist. The white people in my circle, I have very high expectations of them and they meet those expectations. But in, in, a, in, a, in a situation like this, because the other thing we know about sport, for as much as people talk about sport uniting us, sport brings the worst out of a lot of people brings the worst out of a lot of people. And you, if you have an opportunity, if these people have an opportunity to scapegoat some black people, even though these, even though these are the same people that brought England to the final, same group of guys, but if you have an excuse to scapegoat them, then this is what folks are going to do. And I don't know like how much of, like how much me talking about it and how much of me saying racism is bad is gonna change that. Um, because the difference too, it's the extent that like this type of racism here, like this discretionary racism is by choice. People choose to say something, people choose to tweet what they tweet, people choose uh, to try to assault black and brown, brown people on the street. The people that do those things, I don't hang out with them. They don't listen to me. They're not gonna take my word for anything. Um, like one of the lessons of uh, the whole Rachel Nichols drama, right? Was that white people will say stuff around each other that they won't say around non-white people. So I don't know what I can say to, to make someone who's gonna punch a black person on the street because Rashford missed a shot, reconsider. Dave, go ahead. Just uh, the other two players were Biako Saka and uh, Jaden Sancho. Thank you, I could not remember those names. Megan, go ahead. Oh, and ju just that one, one of those players, Saka, was 19 years old. Yes. And the coach, Gareth Southgate, I mean, to his great credit, uh, has has come forward and said, you know, bring the abuse over here because what the hell right. was I doing Put a 19 year old out in that position when exactly. I had other players who should have done it? Frankly, it seems so obvious he should have thought of it beforehand, but at least he's stepping up to the mic and taking accountability. Yeah, and and in this and in the and, and in the culture of that sport too, where people are usually reflexively so hard on coaches for the decisions they make, all of a sudden this is the player's fault. Not to mention, we're gonna, Megan, I'm going to bring you in a second, but um. We, you, you've watched a, a soccer penalty kick shootout. There is no way it is like physically impossible for a goalkeeper to react to a shot. All anybody is doing is guessing. Like this is one step removed from playing roulette. This is almost a pure game of chance. Because if they shoot it on target, either the person has guessed the right way or they haven't. So now you're blaming uh, these players essentially for a goalkeeper's luck because the goalkeeper is never reacting to the shot. Before the shot goes off, this goalkeeper knows I'm going high left, high right, low left, low right, or I'm staying in place. And the goalkeeper is going to block the same number of shots standing still as he or she is diving one way or the other. Yet somehow this is Saka's fault. Megan, go ahead. You know, I never would have guessed in 2021 that I would have had Piers Morgan standing up for black people on my bingo card. Right. right. He tweeted uh, early in the morning, and I quote, when England's players took the knee last night, I was pleased to hear loud applause drown out a few boos. Then our black stars get horrifically racially abused after the game. This is why they take the knee. This is why I support them in taking the knee, end quote. Where was that when Meghan Markle came out and said that she was dealing with uh, racist situations within the hierarchy of the monarchy? Where was this when you had your temper tantrum and stormed off your own show because <laughs> another commentator challenged you on something? Where was this same sympathy and empathy for Black people when that situation was happening? You can't pick and choose when you want to support <laughs> Black people and when you don't want to support Black people. Which is funny that of all people who would have come to the defense of those three gentlemen was Pierce Morgan, of oh. all people. Like, never would have thought I would have had that one on my 2021 bingo card. But I digress. Now, the <laughs> fact that, you know, uh, to Dave's point, a credit to the coach for coming out and saying, or excuse me, let's get my terminology correct, the manager, the manager um, yes. for coming out and taking, taking the heat. But it's too little too late, to be honest with you, in my opinion. As a Black athlete, a former Black athlete, you should have had my back in that moment. If you are going to come out and say after the fact, when all these racist things start to happen because we lost, that you made the wrong decision, you should have known as the manager of our nation's team in that moment that you were making the wrong decision, that you were potentially doing this. Like, 
isn't that like the biggest point of the game in that moment as a manager, that if you go into a penalty kick situation, you have your, if I'm not mistaken, five best kickers and goal scorers in a penalty situation in that moment. Isn't that something that you do in part of your game prep and game, mm. um, game scouting when you go up against a team in, in Italy who, if I'm not mistaken, and please correct me if I, I am wrong, um, is one of the best penalty kicking teams in Euro 2020 was at least in this matchup between the two teams. Cause I saw a lot of that on Twitter when it was going into penalty kicks. All I saw was, Oh gosh, Italy's one of the best. Like that's all I saw. <laughs> and England doesn't have great penalty kickers. Like I saw all of that across my timeline. So please correct me if I am incorrect, but that is what I saw in the Twitter verse. But for me, it's the situation of England showed uh, and please bleep this out if you have to on the editing side, but England showed their asses. They showed their <laughs> asses in this moment. You showed your asses before the, before the match even started with your ignorance and stupidity trying to bum rush security who were probably, you know, not even real security people bum rushing them to get into the stadium because you didn't have tickets. Then because of three players only, not even, you can't even blame the rest of the team, apparently, because if you are so good and it's, it's solely on those three players and those three players' shoulders, why aren't you putting it on the rest of the team for even being tied going into penalty, penalty kicks? Why weren't you up 2-1 in this game then? Thank you. If your team is so good and you're going to put this solely on those three players, why weren't you up 2-1 and this wouldn't have even been a situation? So, you know, at the end of the day, it is what it is. England showed their ass. They showed their ass for what we already knew they were majority racist. They showed their ass when Meghan Markle came out with her situation, and they showed their ass again in the span of what, four months? Maya Angelou always said, when, when someone shows you who they are, trust them the first time. We've had centuries of the UK showing us their asses. <laughs> let this, uh, let this stand as like the one and only time anyone on this show is gonna quote Piers Morgan. <laughs> but what I wanna know you guys, as we close this episode out, is whether you're in or out on uh, one, two, or three of these next topics. One, uh, it's Major League Baseball All-Star Game Week. Uh, we record Monday mornings. I think the Home Run Derby and the Celebrity Softball Game go tonight. Uh, celebrity Softball Game doesn't start till 11 p.m. Uh, Eastern, which is probably a good thing because I can't see uh, Staying up late to watch Quavo, I've heard of uh, from the Migos. Jojo Siwa, I don't know. Steve Aoki, who is listed here as a musician. I, my understanding is that he's more of a DJ. Uh, a rapper slash activist named Residente. Okay. Karamo, a TV star. DK Metcalf, heard of him. Uh, Derek White, who they helpfully, hope, helpfully, Tell us is from the San Antonio Spurs. Otherwise, I would not have known Derek White. And then also CeCe Sabathia, Jenny Finch, Hunter Pence, uh, Jay Cortez. I don't know who that is. Chase Carter, who was a model. Jorge Masvidal. My question to you guys, now that I'm done naming these people off, and these are like the most famous people on the list. There are other people on the list who I don't know who they are. Uh, Megan McPeak, are you in or out on watching uh, halfway famous people uh, play softball? Oh, I'm out. I'll be asleep. <laughs> Dave, you interrupt. I'm out on who Anthony Mackey's agent is because I'm yeah. looking at this list of people of former athletes and yes. hangers on, and I see the new Captain America on this list, and I'm just wondering what Anthony Mackey's agent was thinking. Not since Eminem was telling Anthony Mackey that he went to Cranbrook has there been <laughs> such a shameful moment in the history of the life of Anthony Mackey. <laughs> I'm I'm only in on Jenny Finch and Lauren Chamberlain and then like the other uh, old MLB dudes taking this game really seriously. Jenny Pin Jenny Finch cranking that arm up and just like striking out person after person after person and getting this game done as quickly as possible. Now I realize some of these people might be like young people famous and social media famous. Um, does not mean like ugh, baseball fans want to watch them. Uh, run around a softball diamond. So yeah, I'm out on that. I'm with you guys. Uh, number two, we're going to start with you, Megan, because you're a basketball expert. Uh, we record on Monday morning, Sunday night. 
Phoenix lost by 20 points to Milwaukee in the NBA Finals. Giannis Antetokounmpo had 17 free throws by himself. Phoenix as a team had 16. Monty Williams is not happy. So he's uh, talking in the press conferences about uh, how his team is getting the short end of the stick from the referees because one guy has more free throws than his whole team. If that sounds familiar, it's because Bucks coach Mike Budenholder was doing the exact same thing last week. I'm not going to get into the complaining publicly about fouls. The, just not going to do that. But you can look, you know, we had 16 free throws tonight. One person had 17. Apparently, there are not enough free throws to go around. Megan McPeak, are you in or out on preemptively working the refs to get more free throws for your team? Listen, these coaches got to do what they got to do. I'm in on a coach doing everything in their power that they can do. I won't be surprised if Monty Williams catches a fine. Uh, I think he uh, decisively called out the refs without directly calling out the ref yeah absolutely um, so i but at the same time i won't be i won't be surprised but didn't i email you guys well ahead of this game and said don't be surprised if the bucks have a lot more free throws don't be surprised <laughs> if uh chris paul is frustrated because i mean uh i think now his his t- his ticker is up to like 0 and 12 or like 1 and 11 when scott foster is the crew chief and last night scott foster was the crew chief so look into that as you wish viewers but uh yeah i mean i'm in on coaches doing what they got to do to try and to try and get some competitive advantage i am also in on it only because a couple years back i got an opportunity to watch it like it was the bulls blazers game it was the first day that carmelo came back and uh the seats i had because i had a friend that worked for the bulls were like right next to the bulls bench so i could hear the the talk like the in-game talk Uh, amongst the players but also amongst like the trainers and all anybody ever talks about on the bench is fouls the fouls you don't think you're getting and this is the home team that's all and they 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 uh they encourage each other they 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 wind each other up yeah we don't get that call oh it'd be nice to get that call how come he got that call we didn't get that call 48 minutes that's all they talked about so at least this is like a glimpse of like what people talk about in real life this is like having a a a microphone on the bench you know what people are talking about how i'm not getting enough free throws that's all anybody talks about during a game dave zyron you in or out i'm in on working the refs and i'm always in on monty williams because he's from the dc area uh bless him uh but i'm out on thinking that that's why the suns lost this game (laughs) i mean they missed a truckload of threes and on the other end they were hanging on to Giannis for dear life, you know, as, as if, you know, you never play that game where like you were hanging on to your, your, your mom or dad, more likely your dad's legs and, and he's walking around. Yes. While, yeah. while holding on to your leg and he's going like, doosh, doosh. Yeah, play that game all the time. Yeah. That's Giannis. <laughs> That's why he had 17 free throws. Right. But not enough or too many. It's always a... Never enough free throws. We gotta to get go that around. balance. We gotta get that balance. <laughs> right. <laughs> Never <laughs> enough. Okay, guys. Last one. Um, Conor McGregor got beat up on uh, Saturday. Like that's the only way to put it. He got beat up. He broke his leg at the end of the first round. But until then, for the five minutes preceding them, for four of those five minutes, he was getting pummeled by Dustin Poirier for the second time in a row because now they've fought two times. Now Conor McGregor's famous. Uh, <laughs> was once billed as the Irish Muhammad Ali because he talked a lot of trash, even though Muhammad Ali's great-grandfather was from Ireland, which would make Muhammad Ali the Irish Muhammad Ali, but I digress. <laughs> Conor McGregor. But Conor McGregor is good at selling this idea, right, of, of being the heel and making people think life owes him a butt kicking. You get his, but the thing is, like, you're, not, you're supposed to keep winning. Uh, Conor McGregor keeps losing. My question to you is, Conor McGregor, sorry, also promised, he said he was going to kill, like literally kill Dustin Poirier. So Dustin Poirier would leave on a stretcher. Conor McGregor wound up leaving on a stretcher uh, in some like makeshift tourniquet because they didn't have an air cast for some reason. Uh, But my question to you, Megan McPeak, since you're right in front of me, is are you in or out on the idea that karma came back and did a number on Conor McGregor? Oh, 1,000%. You want to you want to talk all that stuff? I mean, he was he was he was talking a lot in the lead up. Like I saw the interview he did with Stephen A. Smith. He was talking a lot about about Dustin Poirier there. He was talking a lot in in the media sessions, and uh, Dustin was doing some talking. The difference is Dustin backed it up, <laughs> point blank. Period. It's that simple. 
uh, sorry, Connor, you got your ass handed to you and you broke your foot at the same time. <laughs> Sometimes people are better than you. He's beat you twice now in three matches. What do you like? What, what, what are we doing here? What are we doing? They, they are just going to keep rematching. It's going to be like a basketball season, man. They're, they're going to fight 82 times. And <laughs> if McGregor wins 10, they're going to call it success. Dave Zyron, you interrupt on the idea that karma caught up with Conor McGregor. I mean, is it karma if he's just bad at his job? <laughs> Where is the recent evidence that Conor McGregor is good at the thing that he professes to be good at? Yes. I mean, if, if I bragged a lot that I could, uh, you know, fix my bathroom sink and then I failed <laughs> at that task because I have no skill in doing such a thing, is that really karma or is that just me talking out of my behind? I mean, we have no material evidence in recent years that Conor McGregor knows what he's doing. And I think that that's, that showed itself very clearly in this fight. And I got to say, there are few more repellent people in recent years. Mm -hmm. I know the Paul brothers are trying to give him a run for his money, but in recent history, Conor McGregor is at the bottom of the totem pole. Perfect for being the kind of person in 2021 who gets attention for, for all the reasons except for actually being good at his profession. Yes, Dave, I'm I'm with you. Like, I'm all the way out on the idea that Karma did this to Conor McGregor because that doesn't give Dustin Poirier enough credit. Dustin Poirier did this to Conor McGregor because he's better prepared. He's a better fighter. And if Conor McGregor, um, what he's good at is getting attention. And what he's good at, uh, with a lot of support from the UFC and with a lot of support from ESPN, is generating attention and selling the idea that he's still as good as he used to be. But, like, every fight... Like the, the highlights on the pre-fight scissor reel get older and older and older. We get, we're in 2017, the highlights from 2016, 2015. We're in 2019, 2018, the highlights are from 2015. We're in 2021 now, the highlights are still from 2015. And so to your point, Dave, this man is getting further and further and further from his peak, but is very good at convincing people uh, to think that the next time out, he will be as good as he was in 2015. And he is not that anymore he's still good at getting attention uh for some reason and now he's at the point too like once you start talking about like if the only thing you can say is i'm gonna kill you i'm gonna shoot you then your um supply of uh catchy trash talk one-liners is empty dave go ahead i'm just i'm gonna date myself even more than i did earlier in the show when i made the eight mile reference and say, I, thought the, I thought the Haystacks Calhoun reference was even more dated. It was even ahead. more dated. Good <laughs> gracious. Get me a, a cane and a room at the Buena Del Vista. Uh, but <laughs> I, I, I will say this, is that Conor McGregor is what we used to call in the mid-90s a studio gangster. <laughs> <laughs> the, other thing, the other thing, too, that Conor McGregor is good at is cheating people out of their money because, whoo, Shadow Cho Single lost a lot of money on that. Listen, if you're a Conor McGregor fan, it's it's very much like being in a cult. It's like being a Donald Trump supporter. Like you at some point have just accepted that you're going to give your money <laughs> to this con man and you're not going to get it back. Don't bet a, don't bet on Conor McGregor when he's fighting somebody good. Like <laughs> if you lose your money when Conor McGregor's fighting somebody good, that's on you. Nobody told you to bet on McGregor against Mayweather, but McGregor fans bet that fight from 21 25 to one down to three to one. And then they all lost their money, but it didn't stop them from flying to Las Vegas and doing it all again and again and again. That's their problem. It's not ours. It's not theirs. Uh, but what we're going to do, guys, is wrap this up. We went overtime as we do usually, but uh, we're going to lobby for the CBC folks to give us more time because the conversation, like you get these three forces together. You know, it's like trying to put Sugar Ray Leonard and Thomas Hearns in a 12-foot ring. You can't do that. Two masters of the craft dynamic like that. They need a full ring to operate. So we're going to try to get them to give us more than 35 minutes next week. Um, in the meantime, Megan McPeak, tell the people where they can find you. As always, on Twitter, at Megan McPeak. Spelled with an H because it's the right way to do it. Yay. Dave Zyron, tell the people where they can find you. Well, you can find me watching 1990s wrestling and listening <laughs> to 1990s hip-hop and... Uh, wondering why it's not the 1990s, but otherwise you can catch me on Twitter at Edge of Sports. <laughs> um, as for me, I'm at Morgan P. Campbell on Twitter, at Morgan P. Campbell on Instagram. I am too old for TikTok, probably too young for Triller. You guys, uh, in addition to uh, 
leaving a comment, leaving a like, subscribing to the channel, leaving a dislike or leaving a mean comment don't matter because all we're trying to do is feed the algorithm. Uh, audience, here's your other homework. Y'all can Google Haystacks Calhoun. Uh, <laughs> Y'all can Google uh, the phrase studio gangster and it'll get you caught up. Um, until then, we will see you guys next week. This has been Bring It In with Morgan Campbell and I'm your host, Morgan Campbell. We'll see you soon.